Hi, my name's Alfie. My name's Tom. Welcome to the 24. And we are going floater fishing. Well, welcome to A12 Cutting Lakes, just outside of Chelmsford in Essex. We're back for the 24, but this time it's a little bit different because two of us are going fishing. As you guys know by now, we've got 24 hours ahead of us, the aim being to catch as many carp as possible. So let's not waste any more time, get to the swim and crack on. Right, so we are now in the swim, as we mentioned on the way up. Um, we're at A12 Lakes, which is, if you can hear some background noise from the, from the cars, it is, we are literally right next to it, so apologies for that in advance. Nothing we can do about that, but it's all about surface fishing the next 24 hours. That's the only ta tactic we can use. We had a little walk around um, before we came into the car park, and yeah, there's a few out here, so we're going to see how it goes. Uh, it's looking good. It's hard to concentrate on the camera at the moment because as I look out into the lake, there are several carp with back their backs out of the water. Um, and they look like they want to eat a mixer. The sun isn't exactly out today, however, I think that may favour us. Um, it's still very warm, very muggy, uh, little to no wind, which is going to help keep our feed in our swim, if you like, and not let it drift down the lake. It almost looks a little bit too good to be true because they're here, but we'll wait until we've got the rods out and that before we make that decision. But the plan, we might move elsewhere, um, see how this goes. If we're struggling, um, yeah, we might move one, but hopefully we can nick, nick a couple of fish and then move to another lake. We'll just play it by ear, to be honest, but yeah. we're in the swim now. Um, the rules are the rules, although we have been robbed by one second by the looks of things on this timer. We'll get that um, Yeah, that could be a very important second, but I think, well, wherever, where's the start button? There she is. Get it going, mate. I want to go right fishing. Underway. Yeah, we can get the rods out. Let's go. It's really important with this type of fishing, especially when you're fishing for a, a high stock venue, surface fishing, that you work together. And that's exactly what me and Tommy are going to be doing. Um, before we even think about casting a baited rig out into the water, we want to start getting some loose feed in, get a bit of an understanding exactly the, the mood the carp are in. With that, I mean, they, in the best case situation, that spot, that dot spot's going to hit the water and they're going to be taking them in, in no time at all. But there's bird life, there's seagulls, there's wind that's on and off, changing direction. So it's all about working as a team. Sometimes you might have to distract the bird life while the other one gets a rig into position. And yeah, that's why it's always good to do this type of fishing with a friend. So before we actually get a baited rig out there, slicker floaters, get a feel for what's going on, and then we'll have more of an understanding of uh, exactly our chances and what we have to do to catch one. It's supposed to be teamwork, I realise that, but he's already getting a bit carried away. He's got his baiting pouch on already, which I'm not happy about. Um, but no, it won't. We're going to work as a team. We're going to do everything together and it's going to be a lovely day with no arguments or no competition whatsoever. Just let Alfie do all the feeding and I'll just creep in there with a hook bait in a minute. Fish smarter, not harder. Let him do all the feeding, I'll just come in with a hook bait in a minute. When it comes to feeding them, or when it comes to the style or the method that I choose to fish when float fishing, more often than not, it takes patience. The idea being to create a feeding situation, to create a frenzy, similar to what you would do when fishing on the bottom in the hope of a group of fish coming over you and starting to feed. Trying to catch one fish individually when it's out there taking mixes freely can be quite tricky. However, as soon as you bring a group of fish into the equation, two, three, four, or in an ideal world, you know, 20, 30 fish, all of a sudden they become more aggressive with their feeding, they drop their guard, and it becomes easier to get those bites. Well, for me, surface fishing has to be the best way to catch carp, and for a number of different reasons, to be honest with you, but the main thing being is the visual element of things. I think a lot of people get asked, what's your favourite way to catch carp? And most people will either say one or two outcomes. It will either be catching them off the surface or stalking them out the edge. And the two things that they have in common is the fact that you can actually watch the carp take your hook bait. It's all well and good sitting behind three rods and alarms, but you never actually know how close you are to a bite. So 
the time in between bites can actually be sometimes a little bit disheartening. Obviously, you've got to keep your eyes on the water, but you're just relaxing more than anything. And when you're surface fishing, it is just all systems go at every point of the day. And the excitement that can bring, especially if you've got perhaps a big fish coming towards your hook bait, as soon as it's getting near and you can time it, you can almost count down in your head that fish taking that bait and connecting to it and knowing what you've got on the end. I, I just genuinely do not think you can beat that experience in carp fishing. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that was really, really weird that was. I was like, is there a fish beneath that? Because it just looked like a little rud or something just floating on the top and then next one I know it's just the mouth's come up and game on. That is a long while feeding before we've had a had a response like the way we have and now we've got we've got fish feeding in different packs in front of us swimming about four or five different areas which is good the wind's getting up which is drifting the mixes away from us but the most important thing is we've got their confidence and hopefully that's uh that means we can uh, have a few more bites after this one but that's a good feeling it's a good feeling when the perseverance pays off oh, off the dorsal There we go, only a little one, but I uh, hope that's the start of things to come. So the, uh, the fish is safely in the net now, and what I'm going to do uh, is just put some more slicker floaters in because they've either drifted off or the fish have actually eaten, eaten quite a few of them as well, and uh, we want to keep them in front of us, so a couple more dot spots, keep them in front of us and then repeat the process hopefully. So three top tips for surface fishing. The first thing, and I'd say, it's probably the thing that I see people getting wrong the most, and that is not having the patience to feed before putting your hook bait into the water. It's so important. You could spook a carp, you cast a bolt machine or a float into a carp that you can see swimming about. If you haven't built his confidence up, or more so if you haven't put enough freebies in to create a competitive pack attitude, that really increases your chance of not only getting a bite, but keeping them in your swim for longer. So I'd always look to feed the swim first, get as many taken as possible, and over a period of time, the more you'll do it, you know when the right time is to cast in and the results will be better for you. Another tip for me, especially in the summer months, uh, would revolve around using soft hookable floaters or a bait with neutral buoyancy. You can judge and look by the way they're feeding a lot of the time. Sometimes they're very, very delicate in their approach to some, some surface hook baits, usually when they have been hammered on them throughout, throughout the warmer months. So a bait that flies back into their mouth, you, you'll, see, you'll, you'll see them come up to the bait and sometimes they're so slowly moving towards it and they're just sucking the minimum amount. But if you've got a bait that is almost sinking but it's just holding that surface column, one, they're less likely to see the hook and second of all, bang, it flies, it flies back. And this has made the difference on so many occasions for me. Um, if you've got a really buoyant pop-up, they have to suck that much bit harder and it's not mimicking the free offerings and they are clued up to it. And you'll notice that, the more you do it, you'll notice um, yeah, how they can get away with it uh, quite, quite often. My final tip uh, revolves around the importance of being prepared and that is important in not just surface fishing but a lot of different aspects of carp fishing. But you need to make sure you have rigs tied up or your hook links, especially if you're using a bolt machine. And that's because there are sometimes really isolated windows of opportunity. If you've put a spot of slicker floaters out, you've got one in the net, you need to hold them in your swim because if they eat all those slicker floaters as you're dealing with the fish, or you're tying up a new rig, they could soon be gone. So it's sort of two tips in one there. Make sure you keep feeding the swim to keep them in front of you so they don't go visit the mate, matey next door. And second of all, if that hook does blunt or the hook link gets tangled or something similar, make sure you've got plenty tied up so you can get straight back out there and make the most of the situation. It's quiet. Well, there we go, it didn't take too long to get that first bite. I think we've been going about an hour or a half or so. I have to go check the clock after this. 
and it was all a result of feeding the swim, getting their confidence up, and then you start to notice more and more fish taking. And uh, they are being a little bit finicky though. It's a time of year where they've seen a lot of surface baits, so you've got to persevere. But the soft hookable floaters and their neutral buoyancy really do make a big difference. But um, only a small one, but a good start, and we'll see how the rest of the day goes. Cheers, mate. Yeah, I've come down to the to the far end of the lake where the wind's pushing into. Because I've just had a feeling, I come up here early actually, and there was a few bubbling about. Now the sun's come out. There's one just jumped out there. There's some out there. There's definitely a few fish here. Um, and I think it could be worth a cast. And another one just jumped there. Screaming for a bottom bait, I tell ya. I think I'm gonna come and have a go up here for an hour or so. Looks good. There are several other factors that come into it when floater fishing. It's, it's not just a case of turning up, feeding them and catching them, you know. Um, more often than not, there's several other elements that come into it. One of the main ones being the weather, in particular the wind. If there's a horrible crosswind going from left to right or vice versa, it can be difficult to try and control your feed and keep it in your swim. If the lake's quiet, you can often follow your mix and like, follow the fish. Uh, into a different swim or whatnot, but when you're on these pressure data kit lakes, the swims can be tight, more often than not there's not an option to move. So you have to think about your feeding accordingly and try and maximise the opportunity for when those fish are in your swim. I'm only here to watch Tom catch one. Hey! That's not a 10 pounder, is it? A eight pounder. Uh, so the move has paid off. It didn't take long at all. Um, they're still taking, so I think Alfie's gonna have a cast at them now, is he? Well, it, with, that sounded like permission, mate, yeah, so yes. It is. How long? Uh, hang on, clock's here. 21 hours, 58 minutes, so it's just been three hours. Now we've just got to land him. Dare I say, it feels all right, but you never really know with floater fishing and these bolt machines, they all feel good. They're still taking. Uh, but I might have to get wet. Cut, let's get wet. Why not, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I have to admit then, I wasn't looking. I literally just looked down because I tripped over something and the uh, bolt machine did its job perfectly then. How mad is that? He's coming. The important thing with this floater fishing is I'm fishing small hooks. I've got size 12 barbless hook on as well. Plus it's only a 10 pound hook link. So what you can't do is rush it. There's no weed out there as far as I'm aware. So. We've got all the time in the world. Come on then. That's enough now. When I am lucky enough to get a group of fish feeding, it's all about taking advantage of that situation and maximising opportunity. Sometimes these feeding spells can be short, you know, um, you've waited all day for the conditions to be right or the fish to move on to you. And uh, yeah, you need to take advantage of that. So I will always make sure I'm prepared. I'll have hook links tied up. I'll even have a spare rod ready to go. So once I do get a fish in the net, I'll quickly unhook him, make sure he's secure, leave him and get another rod back out there. I'll also be continuously feeding to try and keep those fish in my swim for as long as possible. That will do nicely. He's not bad at all. Big old linear. Yeah, he's a long one, man. Bit spawned out, obviously, but yeah, he's good size.
Surface fishing has always been my favourite method of carp fishing. And in fact, it's the, it's the very first method that I ever learnt from a young boy, you know, fishing, fishing down the local ponds with some free-lined bread or a box of dog biscuits, you know, and it's stuck with me ever since. Um, for me, it just can't be beaten from, from getting the fish feeding, actually physically being able to see the fish feeding on the surface, um, presenting a hook bait to him and then catch him on. It's just, it's just, a, it's just an exciting method and one that, one that can't be beaten for me. All those mixes that drifted down, that's what they were going mental on. Like. So when you do have one in the net, you've got your first bite off the top. The first thing you do, the first thing I do, certainly, net down, look back at your swim, assess the situation, introduce more feed if you're running out. And that all comes down, again, to keeping the fish in your swim, because if matey next door's doing it, or matey over the opposite bank's doing it, they could drift over, and if they make the most of the situation and you don't, you're gonna lose them. And if it's a busy, busy day ticket, for example, uh, you might not have the luxury of being able to move. So uh, keep them in the swim, focus on feeding them, uh, and dealing with the fish when, it, when it's appropriate. And the few hours that followed were uh, pretty mental, to say the least. I think we were up to about nine fish now in what, three or four hours fishing, and things just continued that way. It's carnage! Basically, we would feed them, cast our hook baits out, catch one, and just repeat the process. There was that many fish out there. I think at one point we had four nets full, at which point we had to reel in and stop and deal with the fish, because we had no nets left, and what with the heat, we didn't want to keep the fish retained for too long. And there you have it, the move has most definitely paid off. Uh, that was a manic 30 minutes. I've got two in the net, Alfie's got one. We've had to refrain from casting out again because um, we really need to deal with these fish. It's a hot day. We don't want to keep them in the shallow water for too long. So uh, although they're taking over my shoulders still, Dan the cameraman says I'm not allowed to cast again. We're going to deal with each of these fish, get them back after a quick bit of filming, a few photos, and uh, I think we're going to have another chance or two. Or three. Yeah, 22-12, mate. Lovely. That'd do, wouldn't it? What a start. And here she is, my first of the session. Uh, fish number four in total. Uh, and the move has paid off. It was a mad sort of 30 minutes. They're really stacked up on this in this corner. And uh, both Alfie and I have managed to take advantage of it. Looking around the lake, I don't think there's been another fish caught but um, everyone's fishing on the bottom. No one's got the floaters out. Same old story, really. Uh, let's get him back. I'm not going to keep him out too long. So we've got another two to photograph, and they're definitely still troughing, as I can see from Alfie's face. Um, but well, let's put this one back, get Alfie's one out, see what he's got, and then maybe try and catch another. Lovely. He was ready. Well, there he is, certainly the prettiest one of the day for me. Action's been really hectic. I don't know how long we've been going. It's all sort of blurred into one moment, to be honest. Um, but I think we're just going to keep carrying on. We'll probably change venue later on. If not fishing there tonight, certainly be at a different place tomorrow morning. But yeah, nice pretty one. How long we got? We have 19 hours, 43 minutes. That's not bad. We can wrap it up now, can't we? <laughs> <laughs> to the pub? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, let's get him back. Three on the nose, mate. I'll give you that. Beautiful. No, I am. Two twenties. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> I 
after a flurry of maybe three or four sort of mid double commons, I finally managed to get one of the better ones. This one going 23 pounds exactly. I really like him, he's a cool one. And that's taken our tally up to, I don't know, we must be into double figures between us now. Safe to say things are going pretty well. Right, so I've just left Tom to it. He's putting a few more floaters out for the time being. But in the meantime, I'm going to share with you my top 60 second tip for when it comes to surface fishing. And that revolves around the use of zig screws, but not for zigs. They are very, very effective in surface fishing too, and that's for a number of different reasons. First of all, you're able to change the bait in seconds. Most of the time, your hook link will be fine after a fish. The hook point can still be sharp, but you might have lost a pop up. All you have to do, whip one out, screw that onto the back. What I like to do as well is actually use one of our Cora tools, create a slight indentation on the pop-up, and that means that it sits even tighter to the back of the hook, and I found it's really successful in getting those better hook holds. One final point to mention as well, you also get the shrink tube-like effect with the liner liner style on the, on the zig screw, and it creates really effective hook holds. Today, for instance, we've had 10 bites between us, and we've only lost one, and that's with barbless hooks, so incredible hook-to-land ratio. Consider using them. My theory is, it's clear in the time it's taken for us to photograph those few fish. Um, it's become very overcast, the wind has got up quite a bit, uh, and that coupled with the fact we've just checked the time and it is nearly six o'clock. Uh, and if we're going to a second venue, which we've decided we are, then by the time we pack up, get to the vans, travel to the second venue, it's not gonna give us much time there to, to try and catch another carp or two. Um, so although Alfie wants to catch another one from here, I think we could, personally I don't think it's going to happen, hopefully he proves me wrong, but I just think we're wasting time now and we need to get on the road and get to our second venue. How long is that? 18 hours, 50 minutes. It sounds like a lot, but You've done all right. we have done alright, but when you take into account that we're not going to be fishing for the night period, which is going to be what, from 10pm till maybe 3, 4am that all of a sudden takes out six, seven hours. So we need to, um, yeah, get on the road. Venue number two. And here we are at venue number two. This is Chigba Fisheries in Malden, Essex. It was only sort of a 20 minute journey from A12 where we were earlier. Um, it's a lake that I personally haven't been to in a couple of years now, but a few of the other lads, Alfie included, have been here recently on other filming shoots. And um, the reason we come here is because it offers variety. There's three lakes on site, all of which contain some beautiful, lovely, dark looking carp. Uh, they also love a floater. Um, we're on the main lake at the moment. Alfie's just managed to find a couple of fish in amongst a heavy weed bed uh, and he's trying to get them feed in. Me, I think I'm going to go for a walk back that way. We see a couple jump out, so I think it's worth a dot spot or two of mixers to see if they, uh, see if they fancy a feed. The time now is quarter to eight, so we haven't got long before dark. The plan is try and nick a quick bite now maybe. If not, we're going to chill, get a barbecue out and uh, have a good go for them tomorrow. Right, I'm just uh, repositioned. I haven't been able to find hardly any fish. And then as they've slowly drifted right to left, obviously hit a pack of fish because it's just been from one taking down there, literally like solo fish to um, definitely more than one. So there's a chance on the cards here. I don't know how easy it's going to be, but there's a chance. He's on it, are they? Oh, he's... Yes. <laughs> I was a bit late to react then, I'm not going to lie. I think he had it. And, uh, yeah, that's a small chance. Just um, perseverance. It's certainly um, 
certainly worked this time. We've uh, we started sort of near the car park end, feeding a few slicker floaters, and we, there's nothing happening. I moved a little bit further up the bank. Tommy hadn't got much going, and then I found one cart that was just taking every now and then, like, I don't know, 12, 12 foot out. And it was just one, but as the floaters just drifted right to left, a pack of carp has either moved round or it's just triggered. There was a few fish there, and uh, very delic delicately got a few taken, and then um, my slow reactions actually worked this time. I was very slow to react to them out. I thought he'd taken a freebie and it definitely hadn't. Um, but now it's a little bit different to the other lake because it's full of weed. So I'm going to pay a little bit more attention because it doesn't feel too bad. This is, this, this is the area, mate. I need to get his head up. He's not bad, yes. He's not a bad one at all. Not far off 20 pound, that. Hey, there you go. We have got about another 20 minutes of sunlight. And that'll do nicely. See, it's similar to the last lake. As soon as I've got one in the net, I'm putting freebies back out because when you focus on the fight, you don't know what's going on behind it. You can see whether the fish is still there, sort of out the corner of your eye. But I don't know if they've cleared me out or what. Um, so yeah, just keep them now. As we go into the twilight period. Beautiful. 24, eight. 24, eight. Hey, what a way to round off the day. 24, eight off the top, we take that all day long. Well, that's probably the perfect way to round off this evening. We haven't got much light left now. I should imagine it's probably about nine o'clock and yeah, I reckon a few. 10, 15 minutes or so and uh, the surface fishing is probably done for the day. That's not a bad thing. That means we can recharge, get ready for tomorrow and get up nice and early. I'm talking half three, 4 a.m. just before that light the sun comes over the horizon to try and find these fish because it's often when they're really, really up for a bit of a feed. So. 24 pound, eight ounce of beautiful common, and I'm going into the evening very, very happy indeed. Maybe, 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 maybe. Go on, lad. Go on, lad, here we go. To be honest, I was a little bit disheartened when we arrived. There's loads of seagulls and birds everywhere. There was very little activity fish-wise. Somehow I've got away with it and I managed to get a bite. The difference between that spot and the spot on the right, there was only sort of one fish feeding here, whereas here there was at least two of them. Um, when there's two or more fish, they're competing for those mixers and it is always easier to get that bite. Bit of weed out there though, we just gotta land him now.
is him. He's only a little one, but given the circumstances, I'm really happy with that. Time for a barbecue. Well, he's by no means the biggest fish in this lake. But given the circumstances, I am absolutely chuffed to have caught him. Honestly, I didn't think it was going to happen. The birds were a nightmare. We were losing the light rapidly. And then just like that, I've got a couple of fish competing on the same spot. One cast, terrible cast I might add. Put it right on their heads. Thought I'd spooked them, but they came back and I got that all important bite. It's probably going to be me for the evening, to be honest with you. Um, well, I'll say that, I have put one more dot spot out just a minute ago and I did see one take straight away. So, while the old barbecue's cooking, we might as well have another go. Lovely. Done. Done. They're just very catchable. This, that's the one good thing about this last hour of hour of light in the evening. Not only do the fish want to feed more, temperatures have cooled down. Um, it's the witching hour, so-called witching hour. But also, um, because there's no sunlight, they find it a lot harder to see your hook, your hook link, your bolt machine, etc just makes it a bit easier. When they've been a bit cagey all day, makes it that bit easier. I guess a lot of people um, tend to just at this time. Yeah, and that's, the, yeah that's the other thing. Oh, look, they're having it now. Um, a lot of people presume floater fishing's a tactic for when the sun's out, you know, afternoon, during the day. But that couldn't be further from the truth. First thing in the morning, which hopefully you'll find out tomorrow, so we're going to be up at first light having another go. And last thing in the evening, are without doubt, the best times. Is that a mirror? It can't be. Why can't it be? It can't be a chick bin mirror. I reckon the commons in this lake outdo the mirrors by, I don't know. 50 to 1, would you agree, Dan? As far as I've seen, yeah. So if this is a mirror, then that just rounds off an awesome day. It is a mirror. <laughs> you lucky little devil. Not only is it a mirror, Not a bad mirror. Not bad at all. Well, I did say that there was a chance I was going to have one more cast. As the barbecue wasn't quite ready, I just couldn't resist. They were absolutely troughing. I've managed to catch another one. Not only that, I've managed to catch a very rare Chigba mirror, just shy of 20 pounds. What a day. And that'll be it. Um, we're gonna get him back. Barbecue, maybe one beer, early night. And we're gonna be up at first light to have another go. Well, we just sat down for a lovely bit of food. Got a couple of barbecues on the go to recharge the batteries. I mean, I, I don't know how far we are into it at the minute, mate. What are we uh, looking at? We have 14 hours, just over 14 hours remaining, so we're 10 hours in. And so we're not even halfway through. Not even Nowhere halfway near through. halfway through. 
And I think <coughs> that in its own tells you just how productive floater fishing can be. Well, 12 fish now, I think you've had seven. Uh, I think I've had, I've had seven, you've had five. Three twenties in amongst that as two well. Two different venues um, in just over 10 hours. So, yeah, so. and I, I, I think, as I mentioned, that, that says a lot of just how valuable floater fishing can be and persevering and, and doing it. Yeah, the fact that we persevere, caught loads of carp off the top. A couple of, lost, a couple of uh, ones we've lost as well just through no fault of our own, just hook pools, barbless venue. And now um, what we're gonna do, we could easily chuck rods out for the rest of the night. We might nick one, we might nick two, but to be honest with you, I'm knackered. Oh, I'm most definitely knackered, yeah, and I, I will not be putting any rods out tonight. Instead, I'm gonna get my head down for a few hours, because I mean, it'll be light by what, 3 a.m. So we're gonna get four or five hours sleep, and then um, get back up and get on it. Morning. I've had about two hours sleep. There's lots of swans out there. Got the hump with them already. Seagulls are about. They haven't slept either. What are they doing up so, what are they doing up so early? <laughs> There's no need for them to be up this early, is there? It's about 5 a.m. I'm preparing for another day. Just getting a hook bait ready. Because at any moment. Just need to feed off these swans. My go-to setup when float fishing is without doubt a bolt machine. Um, surface fishing's changed over the years, you know, and I would definitely consider myself one of the new breed style of floater anglers. By this, I mean I'm not spending my time freelining a bit of bread or a dog biscuit down the margin. I'm more often than not fishing at distances and I'm working one, sometimes two bolt machines and I'm feeding heavily to try and get those fish competing and creating a feeding situation. And this is where the bolt machines come into their own. They allow me to present a hook bait at distances that were previously inaccessible to floater anglers until now. Yeah. Uh, yes, that was very tough. I'm not gonna lie. I'd almost given up all hope. We woke up this morning to completely different conditions to yesterday. It's overcast, it's windy, it's raining, and it's cold. I'm chilly, I'm a little bit chilly playing this fish right now. But somehow, I kept an eye on the mixers that were slowly drifting further and further away from me, and a few fish started taking it probably, I don't know, 100 yards maybe. Just kept seeing the odd, odd fish come up, so I put the bolt machine long, let it drift on the wind. Somehow I've managed to hook one. The, uh, the, the bolt machine that I'm using, and used for 99% of the time, that has definitely helped me catch this fish. This is the, uh, the second, second biggest in the range, and I pretty much use it 99% of the time, even when I'm fishing short range because not only does it hold in place, hold the hook bait in place, when it's windy, uh, it doesn't drift, it also helps nailing them, even when you're fishing a long way out, like that one was. That is an absolute bonus fish. My 60 second tip is a little bit different to the norm and it's all to do with actual playing of the carp. Uh, you may have already noticed that um, when, especially with a bolt machine, I like to play my carp with my rod tip low and to the side and there's good reason for this. I've learned from past experiences that when you're using sort of heavy bolt machines coupled with long hook links and you're playing the fish with the sort of the rod, the standard way with the rod in the air, the bolt machine has a tendency to wave about a lot coupled with the long hook link and it's just a recipe for disaster for hook pulls, in particular with barbless hooks like we've been using on this occasion. When you play the fish with the rod low to the side, you've got a direct contact with the bolt machine and then a direct contact again to the fish's mouth itself. Um, and they tend to come in a little bit easier and as a result of this, it massively reduces any chances of a hook pull. So that bonus fish is safely securing in there and there's still a few fish feeding out there. Hello Alfs, decided to poach me up a little bit, but we'll let him. Uh, so what I'm doing now, I've bit the hook link off, 
that's in the net with a fish still. I'm going to tie a fresh one up quickly, um, which literally takes two seconds. Normally about six, seven foot as a general rule I start with. I will shorten them. If the fish are being really cagey and really finicky, I will shorten them down. But as a general rule, I like a long hook link personally. Um, I, just, I just want to keep it as far away from that bolt machine as possible. Tie a little knotless knot onto the size 12 floater claw hook. Cut the tag end off. Slide down my clear zig screw. Uh, and it's as simple as that. That is literally it. I'll tie them to the end of my bolt machine, or the end of my swivel, which is in my bolt machine. Some use a quick, some prefer a quick link. Uh, I prefer just to tie it directly to the swivel, if I'm honest, just for that peace of mind. Six turn green up, and we're away fishing again, just like that. So this bolt machine that I'm using, and I use for sort of 99% of the, my fishing, this is the, the medium of the three, if you like. So it's, it's, it's the second largest, and uh, I just love it. It's perfect for everything. Even when I'm fishing at short range, I'd still opt to fish a heavier bolt machine because uh, when it is windy, uh, it just tends to hold your hook bait a lot. With a lighter bolt machine or controller, once the wind's got it, it, it's all over the shot, you know, and you're never getting that bite if your hook bait's moving around. So this tends to hold in the wind a lot better. Secondly, I can get it out, as you've just seen, to extreme distances. I was probably fishing at about 100 yards, then I probably could push it a little bit further if I wanted to as well. And thirdly, when you are fishing at them distances, even when there's a ripple on the water, like I couldn't see my hook bait then. I was relying completely on the swirl of the fish taking the hook bait and that bolt machine hooking those fish. Even when I, I, I had a little bit of slack line out there, because of the wind, I was letting it. I was letting the bolt machine go on the wind, and uh, even with that bit of slack line at that distance, the bolt machine still nailed the fish and uh, allowed me to be in direct contact with it. So yeah, 99% um, of the time, this will be my choice of bolt machine. I bloody love him. I really love him. Well, Tom's just had a right. Well really good bit of angling to be honest it was looking uh like it wasn't going to happen at all the weather i think tom mentioned it was it was overcast it was raining it was cold slightly flattened off now and then all of a sudden there was a fish uh fish that on the slicker floaters that had started drifting uh with the reasonably strong wind he let his bolt machine drift out there and yeah it hooked itself really on the uh, on that setup which is another bonus of being able to use that type of rig um because sometimes it is a little bit difficult to see. So all I'm doing now is Tom's got that fish in the net and I can get to that similar area from next door and I'm just keeping that bait topped up whilst keeping the swans over there. So it gives us a little bit more time to um, see if there's fish on that spot still. That's the one. The thing is they're starting to follow the spot now, so I'll keep them to the left. Keep that little area where there seems to be a few fish up, uh, topped up. And maybe it won't be such a bad day after all. Well, when I woke up this morning and saw the conditions that had drastically changed from yesterday, uh, it didn't fill me with too much confidence, to be honest with you. Um, however, despite the rain and the wind, I managed to get a few fish feeding at extreme distance somehow managed to get a bite and land this mid double coming. I think what we're going to do now is get a bit of breakfast on, probably pack all the gear up and get it on the barrel, maybe go for a little mooch around the back, back channels, maybe the other two lakes. Conditions are far from ideal but we do still have about five hours remaining believe it or not so there's still plenty of time to add to our already impressive tally. Let's get him back. Right, try as I might, with the uh, sort of middle-sized bolt machine, the 30 grammer, I think that is, I cannot reach them at the moment. They're probably at about, probably 
probably about 100 yards, you know. So, and they're confidently feeding out there. So I'm just gonna, uh, rather than keep trying and hoping for the best, just take a little time out, have a little breather and uh, put a bigger bolt machine on. So I am using on these zig screws, uh, 12 mil scope with pop-ups which imitate a slicker floater perfectly. And you can, as I've mentioned in my, my top tip, if you just bore the back out, get them so flush to the back of the hook and change them in seconds. No need to muck, muck, muck about it, floss or hair rigging. Um, I and mean, all I do is just get that, you see how tight that is to the back. Trim it down a little bit, just to try and make it as closer to a more neutrally balanced bait. So I'm just getting it to the point where the weight of the hook isn't enough to sink it, but at the same time, there's less buoyant material in the pop-up mix. It just helps fly back into their mouth. And at the same time, they stay on. And when you're fishing at range, got a bigger bolt machine, I'm casting regularly, they'll just stay on. I know I won't have to change that, ideally, until I catch a fish. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you do? Like, I, I genuinely don't know what to do. Like, I'm just thinking about last night and the fact that they, and again. Yep. Yeah. Right up. <laughs> Power of the bolt machine. <laughs> now that is just literally, I cannot see, that's 100 yards at least that that bolt machine is out there. So the bolt machine is doing all the work for me. I just actually see my line move before I did the float then. But, if you can get out there, get a nice heavy bulb machine on. Have a little common. All right, that one's safely in the net and there's no way I would have got that bite if I hadn't changed bolt machine size. And I was a little bit guilty of just keep trying to cast with the lower weight, but as soon as I uh, had the extra weight behind me and I could cast that extra 20, 30 yards, it made all the difference. That's where they were happy feeding. That's where you got to be. And the extra weight obviously helped hook itself. So there we go, there's my prize for this morning's surface fishing. It wasn't as easy as we'd hoped. The weather hasn't been in our favour to be honest. It's been really windy, actually a little bit chilly and it's, been made, it's made it really hard to not only spot our floaters but just to feed and, and get them confidently, confidently taken. Having said that, the way the wind's blowing at the minute from where we are, I can see a few fish now feeding on the far bank. So what I think I'm going to do is up sticks and move, walk all the way around there and assess what it looks like around there because I think it's going to be a lot easier to angle for them. And uh, yeah, I think we've got about two hours left. So I think that's, that's gonna be how we're gonna wrap things up. If I can nick one from there, happy days, but it's been, already been a fantastic session. That was it for me in that swim. Uh, the carp become very finicky. It pushed well out of distance. Even the wind wasn't, wasn't strong enough to take our hook baits over there. So we left them to it. The seagulls soon mopped everything up. And uh, yeah, we decided to make a move. It was actually um, another group of anglers who had exclusively booked the lake, which we weren't aware of, but that wasn't a problem. There was another couple of lakes here on site. So that was what our next goal was, to try and nick one from one of the other two lakes here at Chigra. After a little bit of free line in action, um, it became apparent that it wasn't gonna be successful for me. But just as the clock was ticking down, I think there was about three minutes left actually when I had a, a cry from Tom as I was just around the corner. He was hooked into one. And uh, yeah, a last minute carp to, to round off the tally to 16 fish. Well, I just heard Tommy shout, and by the looks of things, he has got one to round things off. We have three minutes exactly, let's just tick to three minutes. In the nick of time, that one, mate. I don't know, am I? Yeah, two minutes, 54. Couldn't write it. 
Looks like I was wrong in the to congratulate you. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> that was a nice one. Uh, it's a nice dark comment, yeah. That'll do. It's a lovely one. Just in time. I knew I had about three minutes left when I hooked him. Well, what a perfect way to end our 24 hours float of fishing. It's a shame we can't say the same about this fish, but they can't all be pretty ones. It was. <laughs> It's always lovely to end a session on a real nice fish and uh, this cousin couldn't have been further from the case if we're honest. <laughs> that fish, that has got to be the ugliest looking fish and as a matter of fact, I've even not had the pleasure, we should say, of uh, hooking that one and landing that one before. But nonetheless, the whole session was amazing and for a 24 hour period to have that much action and the, the rods weren't in the water through that whole period either, um, it just shows you how fun how eventful floater fishing can be and to be honest, I could do it all again tomorrow.